Guy and I are both so steeped in these movies from our childhood. We were interested in harking back to the sort of genesis of spy movies. It's a second nature to us. We were fluent enough in the language of those films to be able to take that language and put a little twist on it, to put, a, put our own little slang and our own idiom on it. I like to make movies that I want to watch. I want to create a world in which I don't care whether it's authentic or not. It just needs to be authentic enough to me for me to believe that it's authentic. After that, it's a fantasy. There's something very modern about the feel of the style of the 60s. To me, it's the coolest era walking onto a set in the 60s and seeing everybody wearing real clothes. Italy in the 60s is quite fabulous. Italians were quite out there with their fashion. We need two purses, please, and every day clutch and grab that belt. The costumes on this movie are absolutely amazing. Joanna, our costume designer, has done an amazing job. Everybody looks good, whatever they do, whether they're washing up or chasing a car, they still look brilliant and smart. It was a higher priority, wasn't it? Natty dressing, sharp dressing. Joanna, she was the first one that I met after Guy and Lionel. I came in for a few fittings, you know, early on, and it's a great way to kind of get into character. You look important, or at least your suit does. You know, you put it on and you feel Napoleon Solo. Allow oh, me. The character of Solo is very considered, and he sort of has manufactured himself into this person, which is a sort of front, really. And he is all about vanity and the projection of his appearance. And he is incredibly considered, so he looks well turned out as a sort of proper gentleman at all times. Great. Joanna is such an incredibly talented designer and so collaborative. We really sort of put our brains together and just created this wardrobe. I started to chat with her and we saw one picture and what if that dress that I just tried, what if you, I love that back. It was the most amazing dress. I have these incredible costumes in this film and they were very obviously very informing as an actor to wear. Victoria is sort of slinky, beautiful, kind of couture but more in her own individual way. She's a sort of match for Solo, she's considered super vain, it's all about projection of her image, super sexy. She's a snake, she wants to snare people into her lair. Sleep well, Victoria. Ilya is much more laid back, so he's suede jackets and cord jackets and slacks, as they call them in America, which was definitely the thing I pulled out from Ilya Karyakin in the TV show. A bow tie doesn't work with that suit. This is one of the few times I actually get to wear a suit. Other than that, I'm in like a turtleneck and a suede coat. So this actually breathes much better right now, so I'm enjoying it. I get to be a child and I get to time travel. So you come out on the street and everything's just changed. You have those 200 extras dressed up. It is such a kick. The period is so fun, you know. Help yourself to a drink. Period movies involve world creation. Completely recreate a new world. There may be the exterior of a building you can adjust, but everything is new. The details of every interior, the telephones, the cut of the suits, the style of the shoes, the style of the hair. Everything is just it's very specific to a particular period. And to, for it to really feel real and authentic, you have to get it right. Where are we going? In the same place every architect goes when they visit Rome. To see the sights. I must say, when I shoot a film, it always helps to be on location. The look of the movie has changed so drastically, dependent upon where we are in the movie, because we've been in East Berlin, West Berlin, and Italy, and of course, secret underground layers and all sorts. We start in East Berlin, and it's what I call concrete colors. So everything's very cold and hard, pretty dismal, really. When we get to West Berlin, that's the sort of the beginning of the opening up and the dynamics of trend emerging through. And then we get to Italy, it's all warms and golds. And we were particularly inspired by the Italy of La Dolce Vita, which I think probably is the most glamorous aspect of the 60s. In Italy, you get all that lovely architecture, which is Mussolini and 30s. You have all these period buildings there, and it's really gorgeous. We were looking for places that had an edge to it as well, so that it had a style, and also to look glamorous. So that's why we ended up near Naples. So this is the uh, layer underneath the Vinci Guerra Castle. I think the most wondrous thing in Naples that we found were these tunnels, which were just incredible. They'd been carved out by people. They were massive. How did they get out there? When we had the illustrations, I was like, well, there's a, a ton of rock underneath that castle. To get to the top, you can either walk up the ramp on the outside of the castle, or you go through the World War II storage areas, and that's what we did. 
A lot of the things we were shooting in Italy were often boat-related scenes. I actually spent quite a lot of this film on a boat. The stipulation from the very beginning is trying to, you know, selling the period with the vehicles. If you get a period vehicle today, they're either completely falling apart or they're these absolutely gorgeous trophy cars that are being meticulously maintained. Obviously, you want something in between. You want something that looks like it's actually been used at the time. Do you mind terribly if I borrow your car? Every Wartburg we had in the film was almost a barnyard find. So it was rusty, it was an old pale blue, brown, green color, falling apart interior, exterior. They needed love. We completely gave them a new life. All the bodywork was done, seals, interior headlining, seats relined, door cards, carpets, dashboard. They were all built from scratch, pretty much. All we used were the bodies. Great fun to drive vintage old Alfa Romeos and all these old beautiful old race cars on the track. And it's a lot of fun. It's, it's visceral, you know? Look at this. This film I'm using has been treated to be sensitive to gamma radiation. These blurred lines here means they've been in close proximity to radioactive material in last 24 hours. The technology in the original Man for Uncle series is all about being futuristic and cutting edge and trying to predict what the future will be. The technology in our film is an attempt to be grounded, to be faithful to the period, and to give today's audience a flavor of what it must have been like in that time so that everything that takes place in our story makes sense. We're showing the root story. So the gadgetry that we know from the series hasn't been developed yet for the spies. What is that? Super hardened boron sharpened with a CO2 laser. The gadgetry that, that Ilya and Solo have at this point is actually the KGB stuff and the CIA stuff. Try and keep it smooth without yeah, juggling. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you don't, yeah, that's right. It's, it's smooth. So you go, the yeah. yeah. CO2 laser. Coming? It's a lot of gadgets. <laughs> I say that it's a tracking device. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, that's a tracking device. It's a tracking device. He's probably out there in the woods. Watching us right now. All the little details that all of us come up with will transport us into a sort of magical place, which will feel that much more real because of those details. It takes you with you uh, to, to develop things and to, to do things you, you wouldn't expect. Yeah! It's the laying the groundwork for hopefully more of these that we can do that people will enjoy. It's just being good fun. Guys constantly trying to do something new with the action. Give the audience something they haven't seen before, which is extremely hard to do. The guy's like visceral, he likes it in there and hard and aggressive. So many people have copied him. It's not as hard, I think, probably just to do action without feeling like you're copying yourself almost. So he's constantly trying to change the way he does things in order to make things different and feel fresh. What I'm about to feed you, Solo, might taste a little better. Where are we going with this, sir? I wonder if it actually looks like a fight. <laughs> But it's messy, and I wanted a messy fight. Yeah, I'm good. The big challenge, I think, in these movies that involve action is coming up with action that feels fresh. And I think, creatively, that's probably the hardest challenge in many ways for us. The guy's style is to be new, be different, be creative, think outside the box. By the time I've cobbled it together, it should look significantly messy and unchoreographed. In fact, I spent the first part of the day unchoreographing it. I like that. I don't want them looking too cool. Lovely. Car chases have been done so many times. We wanted to make something different, something that we hadn't seen before. We looked at the car chases and we wanted to try and make both of them different in their own way. 
If you look at the Berlin car chase, we have Elia driving a Trabant, and we have Gabby and Solo in a Wahlberg. We built both vehicles with a blind driver. So they put this man on top of the car I'm driving. This is in a little tiny little cage. I hadn't seen that before. And this enabled us to drive the vehicles with controlled drivers, but with the artist inside. So I actually get to sit in the car, pretend that I'm driving. One of the things that we did is we did a handbrake turn into a parking space. <laughs> which has been done many times before. But our artists were inside the cars. Hold on. I did it. And then everyone came up to me after the first take. I was like, how are you? Are you scared? And then it kind of clicked in my head that you would probably should be. I just thought it was so much fun. And it was like being in the wildest ride. We wanted to make these cars look like it was two ballerinas dancing within a car chase. We wanted to keep both vehicles really close to one another. And we wanted to drive around corners and we wanted to do a 360 degree spin. So we adapted one of the vehicles to be extremely light and we basically made a rig where we could attach the two vehicles together. When you see that, that is for real. But then when you break that down, you want to be with the artists. So the other thing we did is in a green screen environment, as we built a hydraulic turntable, we got the two vehicles together and independently, we could move the cars backwards and forwards so it looked like they were gaining on one another and also make them move independently and at the same time, rotate them 360. Yeah, and, and uh, on the second time we do it, look over your shoulder. Nicely done. They can drive down an alleyway, and we're driving too fast. Now put your foot down and drive a little faster. We get wedged into the alleyway itself. Part of our job was making that work in real time. An alleyway set was built, and we built a roller coaster rig, which would allow the car to be suspended and have the artist inside as well. And we pulled it down this track into a breakaway section. Every day was tough. We had a lot of stunts, we had a lot of action. You jump out of the window and it's not supporting you at all, like you're free falling at the ground and it catches you at the very last second. <laughs> We're both physical people, so we enjoy to do it. I miss doing all of his stunts on his own, and I mean, I, I mean, he's kind of crazy that way. I mean, like, he's, he's just wild. <laughs> all in a day's work. Guy wanted to land a truck on top of a boat. What we did is we designed a rig that would allow a lightweight truck to drive a distance. We then engage into a rig that we built, and this rig would allow it to land exactly on the spot. Within the boat, we used pyrotechnic charges that were holding part of the boat together as a seal. And then when we blew the charges, that allowed the water to come in. And then with an assisting cable, pulled the whole rig down under the water. It's a rock crawler, which is under there. Of course, everyone got snotty about the fact that it wasn't period correct. But I wasn't going to let that get in the way. We definitely wanted the off-road vehicle, the rock crawler as we called it, to be a strong, powerful, animalistic type vehicle. Guy really wanted to see it coming up extreme hills and kicking up a lot of mud and grabbing. 525 brake horsepower, four-wheel drive, higher, lower ratio, gear ratio. I think it's got a new perfect looking car. It flies. We did manage to take it across water. Guy, at the very beginning, had seen these guys drive a car at really high speeds towards the lake, and they don't sink in it because they're going at such high speed, they literally aquaplane across the lake. Uh, special tyres were added, and the vehicle was pumped up. Here we go. I think that's a movie first that you've never seen before. I was like, <laughs> But when you see that car going across that lake, that car is hovering across that lake. When you do those big action scenes, they do take a lot of time. Yeah! It's tough to do one scene for two weeks. So, yeah, so it's a semi-mac. Yeah, it goes, boom. Yes. Go over, go over, please, Gordy. 
Oh mate, he comes in, stamps, stamps on him, boom, picks him up here, boom, yeah. boom, yeah. and then boom, they show his back. Yeah. Thank you, wrap it up! I think we've come up with some things in this movie that the audience will go, wow, we haven't quite seen that before. It's pure watchability to me. Ah! That's brilliant. I like the film. I like the energy. It radiates. Let's finish this, shall we? This is what we've been training on. It's an old British bike. Sexy bike. It took a little bit of getting used to. You have to ride it like an old car too, but it's still fast. I'm gonna ride the hell out of it. We are on our way to the Matisse factory. We're gonna go see Jerry Lisi, the owner of Matisse, who supplied all the bikes for our movie. I had a torrid love affair with that bike. Jerry, how are you? How are you? Nice to see you. How you been? Nice to see you. Very good, thank you. My name's Jerry Lisi, uh, the owner of Matisse Motorcycles Limited. Well, the history basically is the Rickman brothers that created the Mark III motorcycle and uh, proved to be a very, very successful motorcycle in that period. This is your factory, obviously attached to your golf course and your this, country club. This is the part of it. Yeah. And uh, this is where we sort of do a bit of assembly in here and a few repairs. And how many people do you have working in here? This, Three to four of us. This is my old uh, Harley Davidson, which is more familiar to your country. Yeah, 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 the good old V-twin. Yeah. And you guys do all the tubing and all Yeah, we do the whole thing, you, you really know. Yeah. So you can make these all out. That's what Matisse is all about, because it means half-breed, and you can use bits off anything to make one bike, if you get my meaning. Right, because originally the Matisse's it was, it was basically you would select the engine you'd want, Absolutely, you'd select whatever you yeah. wanted, and then Matisse yeah. would build you the bike you yeah. wanted. Safety. And this is where we do all the, the jigging up and we make all the frames in here, you see. And this would be a typical jig for the frames and these would hold all the plates in place while you're welding them and what have you. How old is this rack? That, that was an original Rickman jig from years ago. The Rickman Brothers? Yeah, the Rickman yeah. Brothers, yeah. It's great to see an old piece of machinery like this that you guys use to make these bikes, especially because, I mean, I would say a large portion of Matisse bikes would probably come off of this Oh, rack. absolutely right, So, yeah. including the ones that they were racing in the it's late really 60s and... Mind reminded they would have probably had four or five of these jigs. Right. right. Well, this is, this is fantastic. Should we go see what it looks like when we get a little more... Absolutely, yeah, I'll take you through. So this bike is a lot closer to the exact bike. This you is used. pretty much the bike you rode, except and it has lights. Right, right. And this right. is the road the version that we yeah. do, you know. So this one is in a stage of completion. But what what yeah. what, are, what else do you have to do on well, this? Well, this one obviously we have to fit the wheels. Now this is pretty much there. This one is a slightly different version. Oh yeah, look at these handlebars. Yeah, these are. They say he wanted this guy wanted different handlebars on them and what have you. You can get whatever you want on these bikes. You right? can do it's what totally you like. Totally customizable. The, the, the things totally customer needs. We deal with that. These bikes are completely bespoke pieces of art, and you know I feel like there aren't that many people who are lucky enough to get to ride them. We actually have someone here who was lucky enough to get to blow up several of them <laughs> through uh, his negligent abuse. <laughs> but uh, this is this is Lee, our stunt rider for the movie, Lee Morrison. Yeah. Good to see you, Lee. Yeah. Hi, Lee. Jerry. I mean, this is the roots of what you do. I mean, you were yeah, a pro definitely. rider. You know, this is this is where it all kind of started. Yeah. It's like getting yeah. back to basics. And it, for me, again, it's the first time I've ridden like a '60s motocross bike. Mm -hmm. So for me being sport with all the bikes, modern technology that I've had, yeah. to get back on these, once you embrace what they are, yeah. it's, 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 so much, it's been so much fun. Well, I feel like we've seen where you guys make the frames, I've seen yeah. where you assemble them, we've seen the finished product. Yeah. Uh, I think we've had enough foreplay. Should we go maybe take one for a little ride? Um, why not? Yeah, yeah, not yeah let's go and do, do it. it. Yeah. Difference from the 650 bike. I gotta do one more lap. Don't get many days like this at all where you get to drive out to the Matisse factory in the English countryside, jump on a motorcycle, and tear it around in a big grass field. I mean, it's this is, I, I've definitely had worse days. I'm not sure if I've had better. 
We absolutely love the bikes, and I feel like it really made that part of the movie. So thank you for letting us use them. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. Yeah. Once we figured out that we wanted to go with the younger version of this and really make it a fresh new thing and do an origin story, Henry seemed like the obvious first choice for Napoleon Solo, and Army felt like the right person for Kuriakin. Henry just works as Napoleon. He sort of captured a Bond-esque attitude. Jack Devaney, checking in. Like other projects I've done, I wanted to make this my own thing as opposed to inadvertently copying someone else's performance. I wanted to build my own character from the script. If I had 15 minutes, we drink tea, eat biscuits, I talk, you laugh. Unfortunately, I don't. Who are you and what do you want? My name is Napoleon Solo. Napoleon Solo is the man with the gift of the gab. He's very smooth. He's a ladies' man. Napoleon Solo was a master of evasion. He was dealing antiques in the black market. And the CIA then jumped in and said, instead of going to jail, how about you work for us? Remind me, Solo, how long was your prison sentence? Napoleon is this unruly and insolent agent. We don't pay you enough to be able to put truffles in your risotto, so long. But for him, it's certainly better than being in jail because it means he can still wear nice suits and nice shoes and dyes and stuff. <gasps> not very good at this whole subtlety thing, are you? This is not the Russian way. Ilya Kuryakin grew up in the system. He's very by the book. He's very calculating. Kuryakin was always the strong, silent, handsome type, and he's more primitive, if you like, primal. I think you should look out the window. He's trying to stop the car. <laughs> One of those actors who brings his own thing to the role, genuinely. Army is such a nice guy. He makes me laugh every day. Both Henry and Nami were spectacular to work with, and they got the tone very quickly. Absolutely hated working with you, Beryl. Fortunately, it's nothing like our characters. If anything, I'd say we have an alarming amount of stuff in common. We both sort of have the same outlook on this movie, and we both enjoyed the movie enormously. He's a great guy. He's a constant professional. He's been, he's been great to work with. Oh, Henry's super funny. I wonder what they do to people without invitations. And Army's like, he's a wholesome, nice guy. And we beat the out of each other the whole time. So it's really kind of funny. But at the same time, we have a, a great time doing it because, you know, they're great partners to play with. Oh! The stunts in this movie, they'd either be to the point of dangerous that it wasn't worth doing and done on a second unit. And the other stuff was okay. Stand by to do this, our boys and girls. He did some swimming stuff, did some driving stuff. Nicely done. Good old army's very handy on a motorbike. We managed to submerge a truck under the water, allowing only little bits of seeping water to come into that environment. And then we allow that water to fill up that void. And then once that had been filled, Henry swam out through the window. Good land, Henry. Just in front of you. Right, you want, you want to get it just before the water starts getting to it. Really? All right. He did it twice. We rehearsed it once with him, and he watched the stuntman do it, and then uh, we put Henry into it, and, um, and he did better than the stunt guy, and uh, really sold the shot. If it gets into panic mode, you'll take his fingers across. That would help. And that is, is great testament to Henry, because he's a very competent guy and, and extremely fit. So. Oh, yeah. Ring it. Goodness, I've got gloves on. <laughs> Stunts and effects like that can only be done when you have the collaboration of, of an artist like Henry. The much as you get the actors to do, the better you are. We're blessed that Army and Henry are such great guys. They want to do everything they can themselves in the nicest possible way. <laughs> in the boat chase, Army in particular had to do uh, a lot of driving of the boat. He's a natural. He jumped into the boat and he drove the boat around. So it gave us the freedom to film Army in the boat doing pretty much everything. But, well, not pretty much, he did do everything. Not bad with a little parallel parking. And again, in saying that Henry drove the buggy in the off-road chase, you'll see Henry driving that buggy. Henry jumped in it, drove it, did an awful lot of it, and it looks fantastic. It's just as much fun as it looks. Perfect. Oh, 
Guy's work ethic and work method, I really enjoy it. In between takes, you know, you're playing games of chess, you're playing the guitar. Our mate even taught Guy now to play the guitar. So they do little performances and they have made a few songs. Guy loves chess. There's a lot of chess going on on set. Chess, I don't really play. So I was like, okay, cool, they're playing chess. I'm gonna go away and be quiet somewhere else. Oh, you naughty boy. <laughs> Guy's a great chess player. Actually. Oh, that was okay, I caught it. Don't worry, don't worry, we're okay. Yeah, okay. Still up. <laughs> Steve Clark Hall is the only person on set who beats Guy consistently. Guy Ritchie. Is he here? Whatever. The guy is interested in life and in people, and he's definitely a man on the journey. I mean, I love him. He knows. I, I tell him every day, I love you, man. <laughs> I'll have a go. Well, Most choose your tools, surgery. choose your tools, but I've got to say, I'm quite attracted to this. But you got one of those as well. It's a radio. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but what you can play about, you got loads of bits. Pull its teeth out at some point. <laughs> I've always wanted to work with Guy. I couldn't respect his films more. I love his filmmaking style. I mean, it's a Guy Ritchie movie. <laughs> what other reasons do you need? He's taking that weight and he's rolled. It's like, what the f I know what. Bam. Yeah, a typical day, you show up, you get ready, you come to set, Guy comes in, and he says, let's just run this. Let's, let's see how it sounds. <laughs> then he looks at you and says, what do you think? Anything you think you can make more clever? I don't think I'm this strong. And he'll either go, oh, I quite like that. Or he'll go, nah, that's pretty So it's like, oh, what am I going to say? Good evening, gentlemen. Oh, a touching scene. I'd say the guy's directorial style was very uh, unorthodox, but very interesting. You know, we improvise a lot in terms of the dialogue, and there's never any panic. You have a new code name. He's very, uh, very assured. Uncle. Action! Cut. Straight back to first position, running one more time. Quiet! He likes a very relaxed environment. It allows for creativity. It's a very spontaneous process, I think, working with Guy. He is able to magic these amazing lines out of thin air. You have the beats that we have to hit, certain story points that we know we have to have the characters say, but can we make this better now? It's been a great feeling always knowing that you've done more that was actually on their page. That's really a privilege to work with someone who's that open to your suggestions. I've never known a set which feels so lacking in tension. It's fun. You get to really have a hands-on role in the filmmaking process as opposed to just having a mark on the floor and someone says, stand there and say this. It just lets us loose. It kind of pushes you too. We get to know our own characters even more. It keeps you on your toes. You do your homework because you know things can change and it always ends up being better somehow. Yeah, army, when, when you swim off, don't swim off elegantly. Yeah, correctly. All right, stand by to go. <laughs> <laughs> on the end, 68, take nine AV cameras on the end. This way, Peril. OK. This way, Peril. <laughs> Not everybody can be as tough as actors. OK. They're clothing, but heavier and wetter. <laughs> Honestly, Uncle... Uh, oh, that was English. <laughs> you don't need bigger glass? I will finish this bottle. Oh. I don't want to dance, but you do, do want to Whack. You're going to have to... You're going to have to keep pushing him through, like you mean it. Don't you make me put you over my knee. You don't want to dance. But you want to wrestle. I'm not gonna say that. <laughs> this yeah. table's gone. Did a little action. Can we just do that? Yeah. Can you, can you get her up from there? I mean, or is that quite production? I think. I'm right. <laughs> I don't know if I if I have something I can put my foot under over here. Yeah, we can arrange that.
This was the helicopter that uh, Honor Blackman uh, piloted in Goldfinger. It's a 1960 Hiller UH 12E4. I bought this in 1999 as a non-flying piece of wreckage and spent eight years of storing it. I think they got it. It was such a big production and of course it meant an overseas travelling and a real logistics nightmare to take the aircraft to pieces and send it to Italy and then rebuild it and then carry out the flying sequences. One can be like this. And one's getting out the other side anyway. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Swing yeah. Action! That was a highlight of this aircraft's new existence. I'm Rory, Rory Gibb, and I am the assistant director trainee. So my grandfather was good friends with both Hugh Grant's father and Guy Ritchie's father and they were all in the same regiment of the Seaforth Highlanders up in Scotland during the Malayan emergency out in the Far East. So this is the photo. This was taken, we think, about 1949. So we've got here, this is Ian Gibb, that's my grandfather. This is James Grant, so that's Hugh's father. And this is John Ritchie, which is Guy's father. And because they were good friends, they all got together, and for that they needed a driver and they all went for a round of golf, and that's why they're still all armed, was in case danger arose. <laughs> <laughs> what we're trying to do is replicate this photo, but with the offspring of these three men. Which I love. Yeah, they got the props as well. I know. <laughs> we have a lot of help from the other departments, and we have a stand-in for the driver too, so they've gone all out on this. Three, two... Closer, is that right? Yes, you need to come closer. Right. Right. You need to come closer. Come back again. Come back again. Bloody monitor. Genius. That is genius. <laughs> <laughs> the effort that all the other departments have put in just for this one photo just makes it so special because it's a family thing, but at the same time, it's so special to us three.